Okay, as those of you who have been here before know, on a Friday evening, I don't just uh, explain what the Buddhist principles are. I expect many people to know that. You can read books, you can do research on the internet. I, I prefer explaining just how these Buddhist principles and attitudes can help in the problems of our modern life. Just how you can put these ideas and practices to use to solve very powerful and um, hurtful problems which each one of us face and to understand that how these problems arise in the first place and usually it's because of some letter or some comment someone made earlier so I'll try and keep these relevant to the week which I've just had and I did receive a letter from somebody from UK asking me can you please talk about how to deal with abusive relationships at home and at work and especially bullying which is here in many places of our life whether it's uh, bullying at school or bullying at the workplace or even bullying at home or even bullying in the monasteries <laughs> you can find it anywhere and instead of just uh, giving you advice it's the usual the Buddhist idea to find solutions to these problems is actually find out what the cause is and what's the reason why people resort to bullying why would they do that in the first place and when you can actually understand the cause of these things and some of the situations which engender such things as abuse and bullying then you can actually have a much better solution to solving that problem and of course it is a big problem in our modern world, even governments try and legislate as if you can solve these problems through government action, uh, through legislating in the workplace or in the schoolyard, but it still always happens. So how can we find a deeper solution to this? And of course if any of you, I have to say this at the very beginning, are suffering abuse at the workplace or abuse at home, sometimes you have to report it to the relevant authorities just to save you know not just your physical well-being but your emotional well-being as well that's why that we do report these things sometimes people do need to be almost a force to face the fact that they are being abusive and that's unacceptable and that's really wonderful that we can do that these days in a world like in a country like australia but that's, and I have to say that first of all, to report it, because sometimes people, they try these other methods and they don't use the obvious ones. But sometimes one thing which I have noticed is that wherever I see hierarchies, I see the uh, emergence of bullying. And when there are no hierarchies, it seems to be that bullying doesn't really occur. And I've noticed that association. And I've noticed that association that obviously in the schoolyard there are the hierarchies, the physical hierarchies of some children who are more physically developed than others. You can see that sometimes where some people are more intellectually developed than others, their ability to use language is more refined. And you do see this with people migrating to a country like Australia where English is not their first language and they can be subject to verbal bullying because they just do not know how to defend themselves they just haven't got the language skills to defend themselves and you can know those many examples of how bullying can occur with language and sometimes we can laugh at these things uh, just how some people are so sharp with the way they use words they can be so cutting it can be even more devastating than a punch on the nose and uh, one of my favorite retorts, you know, which this is the second favorite, was the one which was used by Oscar Wilde. This Oscar Wilde was this very sharp but very acid-witted man in UK. He was gay, he was out there getting drunk one night, and when he came out of a bar or a pub, staggering, an English lady, you know, a proper uh, woman, came out and said, Sir, you are drunk. And his response was, Madam, you're ugly. <laughs> but then he added the killer punch. The difference between us 
is in the morning, I will be sober. <laughs> now that is a use of language which is really, really cutting. But I must admit my favourite number one retort, and I'm sure that many of you here would appreciate this, any Kiwis here from New Zealand, was the uh, New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Lange, some years ago, quite a few years ago when he was the Prime Minister of New Zealand, he was asked about so many people leaving New Zealand to come to Australia. And they thought of that as a brain drain. And he said, no, it's quite the opposite. All the people leaving New Zealand, they only help increase the intelligence, the average intelligence of New Zealand, and also increase the average IQ of Australia at the same time. And if, if you work out what he was saying, it means only the dummies would leave New Zealand. But even the dummies who left New Zealand are more smart than the average people in Australia. <laughs> and of course, I'm Australian, I don't agree with that. But it was a very wonderful retort of a man who really knew how to use language. And so sometimes there can be bullying using language as well. But I've noticed this, whenever there's hierarchies, whenever superiors and inferiors, then people sometimes either use their positions of superior power, the bosses, the kids with more developed bodies, the people with, with sharper language skills, they can use those skills just to coerce or to humiliate, which is one of the two main reasons why people bully. To coerce you to actually to do what they want to do. And the other one is just to humiliate you. And you only find that happens when there are hierarchies. And it's one of the reasons why I said you could have bullying in monasteries, but we've tried very hard, you know, actually to take off the hierarchies as much as we can. And for those of you who have visited our monasteries, sometimes it's very hard to know who is the senior and who is the junior, because we all wear the same type of robes. We don't have stripes, crowns and pips and stars on our robes to see who is the general and who <laughs> is the corporal and who is the private. And there's a point to that, because in, even in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha was very strong not to have such hierarchies. For those of you who don't know this, this is just part of basic Buddhism, that Buddhism was, was conceived or was born uh, in a place which was a long-standing democracy. Every person who says the democratic traditions which we follow here in Australia, sort of, that they came from ancient Greece does not realize at the same time in ancient India there were very long-standing democratic traditions and it was those traditions which the Buddha adopted for his monastic systems. We are the oldest continual democratic institution in our world. What we call the Sangha, the groups of monks and nuns. Even to the point, if we make a decision like an ordination ceremony, we do the reading of the bill first of all, and we repeat it three times. Exactly which you have in the Westminster system. Now that's fascinating that it's almost exactly the same. A democratic one monk, one vote, one nun, one vote. And because of that, it's unlikely to have hierarchies. Of course, the nature of human beings has tried to impose hierarchies uh, on these uh, should have been democratic systems. And from there we can get the bullying, the misuse of the differentiations of power created by hierarchies. So having seen that hierarchies is one of the problems, and of course the other thing, I did hear that the Pope has resigned, and don't worry, I'm not going to nominate myself for the vacant post. <laughs> Apparently you do need to be a Catholic, I heard, to become the Pope, so I'm, I'm out of contention. <laughs> but we don't have a Pope in Buddhism because one of the 
powerful statements of the Buddha before he passed away when they said, who's going to take over this religion once you're dead? He said, no one will. No one will take it over. Let the teachings, let the training be the leader from here on in. And with that simple statement, that has distinguish this Buddhist tradition from most other traditions. We cannot have a leader, because the boss said we can't have one. Which means that there can never be a pope. Even the Dalai Lama, he hasn't really got any power, only the power people give him, because of his uh, spiritual authority and his uh, you know, wonderful conduct. But other than that, he's got no, uh, no essential authority to control or do things. Neither of high. We do joke in our committee here, because you know, we're having some elections soon for a new committee, please stand. We sometimes joke that my real title is spiritual director of the Buddhist society. And a past president once said, no, no, you're not the spiritual director, you're the spiritual dictator of the Buddhist society. So no, I'm not, please, hope I never am. So we all have this beautiful democratic tradition with no real leaders. And because of that, it's very less likely to have any bullying. But when there is those hierarchies, you can find there is bullying. And I'll give you a, a story. In my first year in this monastery in Thailand, where hierarchies were imposed, even though they were against our tradition, I was a young monk just learning the ropes. And those of you who've been to our monastery, see we eat one meal a day, just in our big bowls. We have a breakfast as well, but the main meal of the day, we have a big iron bowl, or steel bowl, we put the food in there. We also have next to us a little um, waste vessel called a spittoon, you know, to throw any sort of uh, rubbish in, like uh, pieces of paper or whatever. And after finishing the meal, I was washing my bowl with everybody else and also the waste vessel as well. And this monk, who was senior to me, he strode over to me, and he loomed over me in an imposing way, and then started shouting at me, Brahma Wangso, that's a filthy habit, don't do that. And he shouted that. I'm, I'm really trying my best to be angry, but it's so hard after so many years of, of being a monk. It's so hard for me even to act as an angry person. I will never get a job uh, in any movie. <laughs> even though I try my best, it just doesn't come out. But imagine a real sort of person trying to intimidate you, saying that's a filthy habit, don't do that. And I said, what am I doing wrong? You're wiping your waste vessel with the same cloth you're wiping your holy bowl. Now I thought he may have a point, but then I looked at what all the other monks were doing. They were doing exactly the same. Now you know what it's like when you're being bullied and intimidated. You're not really doing anything wrong. Everybody else has been doing that. They always do. That's the way it's always been done. Why are you picking on me? When you're being bullied, isn't that what you think? Now, fortunately, I had some training in my meditation. You could understand the way the mind works. And also, you could find some innovative responses to when you're being bullied like that. Of course, the first thing I wanted to do was stand up, nose to nose. What are you talking about? Everybody's been doing this. I do this every week. There's nothing wrong with this. What's your problem, mate? <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, that's what you would want to do. But you realize that that would not solve the problem. In fact, that was the response which was expected by that bully. He wanted to wind you up, make you upset, make you angry. But instead I realized what he was up to, and I exerted some self-control. It's hard to have self-control emotionally, and mostly because our minds are very, very weak. I've been telling a lot of people this last fortnight, you go to the gym, to get a strong body, to get strong muscles, so you can, you, know, you can run, you can play, 
you know, play all sorts of sports, swim, whatever you do. You go to the gym to strengthen your mind, to strengthen your body. Where do you go to strengthen your mind? You go to a place like this to learn some meditation. Then you're getting very, very strong mental muscles. Your emotions, instead of controlling you, can actually be tweaked by you. So you don't always have to get angry. You have a choice now. If you want to get angry, it's up to you. If you want to stop it, you can stop it, just like that. Because you've strained your emotional muscles through meditation. So because I was meditating for years by this time, I could decide not to get angry. I must admit, it was like shaking. I using all my restraint, because this fellow was just really over the top. He was a monk. But what I did was silently and on purpose walk very slowly to a little, little basket which had some old rags and pick one up. And as I was doing this, you know you can feel all the eyes of all the other monks following you. Because life in a monastery is very boring. When you have an altercation like this, no one wants to miss it. <laughs> so they're all following me with their eyes, and I picked up a rag, and even more slowly, using all of my self-control, walk back to where I was sitting, and take the waste vessel, and start wiping it with the rag. And then I looked at this monk. I'd done exactly what he asked, quietly, serenely, with no trace of being upset. And all the other monks looked at him too. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> he never expected me to act like that. Sometimes the way to actually to, to uh, solve these situations is to do the unexpected. Do something which no one else does. Because that really just, it fuses the brain of these bullies. They expect a certain reaction, and when you do something different, they just do not know what to do next. So this monk, he went bright red. He went crimson. And all the other monks started laughing at him. And he left. And he never tried that on me ever again. He realized that the reason why he was trying to bully me was to show his superiority. A lot of bullying, that's what it said, not for coercion, it was just humiliate you so they appear superior. And in the situation of a spiritual um, group, like a monastery or a church or a temple, everybody knows the superior people are the ones who don't get angry. The winners are the calm people. The people who just get upset, violent, they are the losers in a community like this. He knew it, everybody knew it. That's why that particular altercation was solved very easily. Just by doing things a little bit more different. So please remember, when people try and bully you, Half the time it is because they want to demean you. you. They want to make you feel diminished. And if you refuse to do that, refuse to be upset, and sometimes it's just smiling, sometimes just walking away, sometimes it's just ignoring them. Whatever it is, if you don't show that you're in fear and diminished, then the whole purpose of bullying you is thwarted. And a lot of times they don't do that to you again. You just can't be intimidated in such a way. So one of the things which you often tell people when people are abusive to you, sometimes it's not the right thing to get angry back. If you get angry back, it just you're playing into the hands of the violent ones. Sometimes just stand there and be very peaceful if you can do that. And with a bit of training in this joint called the Buddhist Society in Nodamara, it's amazing the sorts of things which you can do. Even in Christianity, they said, you know, to turn the other cheek. Now, don't do that, you just get hit twice. <laughs> Much better than that. 
is another famous story which comes to my mind because it happened about maybe 30 meters from here, halfway down the road Nansen Way which leads to this temple. You know, we have been in this temple for, oh, must be about 26 or 7 years now. I forget how long, but it's a long time. When we first came here, this hall wasn't built. Our main hall where we would have all our meetings was what we call the community hall. And when we first got this place, we were so proud. We wanted to have an opening ceremony. And, you know, opening ceremony for this place, we decided to invite all sorts of people. And to our great surprise, for those of you who remember, we wrote to the Governor of Western Australia, who was Sir Gordon Reid. He used to be an ex-Chancellor um, of UWA. And to our surprise, he accepted. He would come to our opening. Now that's the Reid Highway, is named after him. So Sir Gordon Reid came to our opening ceremony. That was such, such a wonderful thing. And I was a number two monk here, and I was given the job of hiring the marquee, the chairs, and all these other things for the VIPs. And I was told by our treasurer at that time, I forget who he was, don't worry about the expense, we want to put on a good show. So I rang around and I got a higher firm in Cottesloe. You know, this is one of the good suburbs, not Balga. <laughs> I shouldn't say these things, I'd be in trouble. It's okay, Balga people, it's just a night. Well, but anyway, you know what I mean. Because <laughs> I wanted the best. And I told the manager of this company, who hires out to, you know, Dalkeith and Peppermint Grove and all these rich people's places, so we are trying to put on a good show. We've got the governor of West Australia coming. We want the best. We want about 10 VIP chairs, about 100 other chairs, a nice marquee. Yes, sir, we'll do that for you. We'll get you the best. And when it came, when these, this came on a Friday afternoon, I was busy helping someone else. Because that's what you do as a monk. You don't just do your own job, help someone else. And so they unloaded when I wasn't watching. And you wouldn't believe, this isn't an exaggeration. This is absolutely true. Those who were here will probably tell you it was true. That marquee was filthy. It was covered with red dust, as if it had been out in the whoop whoop somewhere. But that was easy to solve. Get the hoses out and hose it down. The chairs were also filthy. But again, we got some rags and dried them all off. But the problem, which I couldn't solve, was the VIP chairs. The VIP chairs all had legs, different lengths. <laughs> they wobbled, not just a little bit, a lot. And I just couldn't believe this. They just sent us rubbish. And I rushed to the telephone, and I caught the manager, this woman, just before she was about to lock the office and go home. It was late Friday afternoon. And I said, look, do you remember me? We asked for the best. We got the governor coming to, uh, on Sunday. So yeah, we remember you. What happened? Look, the chairs, they're not the right length. They wobble. We can't have the governor and his wife falling off during the speech. But she was very good. She said, yes, we'll, cha we'll change the chairs for you. Thank you so much. Now, of course, Perth, Friday afternoon, workers, where do they go after the office? They go to their second office otherwise known as the pub. And what happened was the manager went into the pub where she knew all his workers were and said, guys, get back to work. The Buddhists want their chairs changed. Now, when you get a worker out of a pub on a Friday afternoon to go back to work, they're not exactly compassionate. <laughs> or peaceful. They were really angry. And this time I was waiting for the truck to come. And it was only halfway, you know, from the corner to this temple, the truck was halfway along uh, Nansen Way when one of the guys jumped out of the moving truck. 
It was a really dangerous thing to do because it was still going pretty fast. He jumped up out and came running towards his temple with his fist like this, saying, where's the bloke in charge? I want the bloke in charge. He was so angry. And I walked up to him and I said, I am the bloke in charge. <laughs> now this is how you deal with abuse. Especially when your abuser has got his fist about one inch from your nose. And that's what he did. He came right up to me, fist right in front of my nose. His big eyes, like these red monsters you see in the temple drawings in Thailand. <laughs> but the worst, the worst of it, was he'd just been in the pub. So his breath, his breath felt so much of beer, and I had to breathe that in. That's the most alcohol I've ever had in my 40 years as a monk. And so there was this, like the high noon, the monk and the angry worker. You know, who would win? <laughs> and you know what happened? All of my friends, all of our committee and other workers, did they come and help me? <laughs> no. They were just looking. <laughs> What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? That's really what happens when <laughs> your friends, they don't come and help, they just want to see what's going to happen next. They're excited. <laughs> so they're the two of us. Now, how to deal with abuse? I knew, you know, from just being a meditator, that if you can have a fight, before he punches me, I would have to respond, yeah, 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 and who else? Yeah, and your mates? Yeah, and my mates? <laughs> you know what happens in a fight? You have to have the equivalent in sex, you have to have foreplay before you bang each other. <laughs> and I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and once you understand just how abuse and violence actually happen, it's so easy to stop it. I just looked him in the eye, perfectly still and peaceful. And you know, that was one experience I will never forget because I knew, and it was absolutely true, I had that man totally in my power. I had him like a puppet on a string. He couldn't move. He was stuck there. Because I was not responding in the usual way of being afraid or being violent, standing out for myself or complaining, I was just perfectly still, just looking him in the eye, watching, with actually kindness. He couldn't move. And I had him there for about two or three minutes. It must have been. Because in that time, the truck had parked, and the boss had come out, and he walked towards both of us. He put his hand on his mate's shoulder and said, come on, let's unload the, the chairs. I said, yeah, I'll help you. That was the only way, the only circuit breaker, which could let that guy be free from me. And I love that little story, because that just shows what can be possible. Then we just, we just um, unloaded the chairs together. No violence, no animosity, no more bullying. I'm not going to stand physical bullying. There's another way of dealing with it. You're just not going to play that game. Stand up, be peaceful, don't react, if that is appropriate. Now, I've got to be careful here, because when I tell these stories, I can do that, because I've been a monk a long time. You try those tricks, <laughs> and some punch, you get punched too often, and you come back, Ajahn it didn't work. Yes, you haven't been meditating enough. <laughs> but it just shows you the sort of thing which is possible. So try and not to react in the usual way. Try and react in a different way. But that's actually if you're in that situation. But the best of all is to please, can we try and avoid the hierarchies of life as best we possibly can? Because those hierarchies, they're just the fertile ground for bullying. I am superior than you, and I'm going to prove it to you. I've seen that when I've visited prisons. Now, the prison officers, there's a lot of really good prison officers, but some are just in there just to lord it and bully it over people who have no recourse, you know, the, the people in jail, the prisoners. You've seen that in schools, especially in the old days, the, 
the masters wielding their canes, whatever, they could do whatever they liked. And sometimes they were bullies. People with power over others. And again in schoolyards, when there's the big kids and the little kids play in the same yard. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you want to stop some bullying in schools, how about maybe somehow, I'll just have a suggestion, having different like playgrounds for the different grades. So the big kids and the small kids you know, don't meet that often. So there can be some segregation. So the physical differences is not accentuated. So as soon as there is that hierarchy of power, then some kids are going to abuse that and bully others. And it's the same also in organizations and companies. If we can try and stop the hierarchies, then there will be no real situation or less situation where bullying can occur. Why do we need hierarchies in companies? big bosses who have not little idea of what goes on in the shop floor. Does that work? I know there are some companies, there are some bosses who really do get their hands dirty, who really do go and find out what other people are doing, who are actually basically you know, one of the workers, not just a boss. And those workers are always really highly respected. In other words, they understand what's going on. Yeah, you have to have a little bit of hierarchy. Somebody has to you know, front the board meeting. Somebody has to answer the phone while other people are sweeping the floor. But you never take that as you're being superior than others. Our problem is, and this is one of the other core reasons why there are, are hierarchies in the first place, the idea of like conceits, worrying what other people think of us, worrying about our status in the, in the pecking order of our family, of our business, of our life. For goodness sake, that idea of conceit, just because you're an abbot does not mean you're any better than anybody else. In fact, the whole idea of conceit was very strongly um, taught in Buddhism as being a great delusion and a dangerous one as well. And if you haven't heard this before, I was very um, interested and inspired that the Buddha's understanding of conceit was far deeper than what I'd heard before. I always thought that being conceited was thinking I was better than somebody else. But the Buddha said, no, no, that's only a third of it. Even thinking you're worse than somebody else is also conceit. I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Because sometimes I thought I was worse than other people. So that's just as bad and dangerous as thinking you are better than somebody else. And I never realized how dangerous that is to think you're worse, inferior, useless, hopeless. Can you understand what I'm saying there? So much of our life we are diminished, demeaned, we think we're not up to scratch, that we're not really good enough, that we're not pretty enough, we're not clever enough, we're not strong enough, we're not, whatever it is, we're not enough of it. And because of that, what happens is we have to prove that they're wrong. And that's again where some bullying comes. People who bully often have an inferiority complex. They feel they're not good enough. And they're trying their damnedest to prove the opposite. And they go bullying. That is another type of conceit. And I know that that is probably the biggest cause of bullying in a place like Australia, because somehow or other, that other idea, I'm really good, I'm really wonderful, I'm really the best, I'm superior, that is really not very common. In all the people I've talked to and counseled, that is rare to see an authentic case of that sort of, uh, I am the best. I did meet that once, you know, I did actually meet Muhammad Ali once, when I was only 11 years of age. And he was actually fighting, as he was Cassius Clay at the time, and he was fighting in London. My dad said, oh, he's, I think he's training in the White City. And I went with my mate, 
school holidays, hanging around here for a while, and a few sort of African Americans came and said, "Any of you Cassius Clay?" And said, "Yeah, that guy is." Oh, great, sir! And we got his autograph, and he said, "Do you want to come and watch us spa?" So we went in watching him spa for an hour. A wonderful time. You know, he was. He always used to say, "If anyone as old as me, I am the greatest. I am the best." But that was just his his the way of presenting. You know, really, he was just a really nice guy, Muhammad Ali. And I remember, as an 11-year-old, when he was at the height of his powers as a boxer, or just becoming a great boxer, a really nice guy. And a couple of, you know, white kids from sort of uh, back streets of London invited us in to come and watch him spar. I always remember that, just great guy. And so, to have a really proud person is very, very rare. And such proud people, you know, or one who really is good, they don't... They don't need to enforce their ego. They don't need to bully people. They don't need to try and intimidate people. They don't need to. It's only those ones who think they're inferior need to. And that's one of the reasons why that lack of self-esteem, thinking you're not good enough, always being told off from the time you were born, there's something wrong, I don't know what it is, but there must be something wrong because everybody's telling me there is. And you know what it's like at school? You're never clever enough, you're never good enough. You try and find a partner in life, you know, as a guy, you know, you just don't match it with, you know, Bruce Willis. As a girl, you know, you're just not as attractive as... Who, who's a... Sorry? Angelina Jolie. No, she's old now, isn't she? That was last year. <laughs> who is the hot chick of today? I don't know. <laughs> you have to tell me. How would I know? I'm a monk. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I mean. You're always compared, aren't you? You're compared with impossible targets, which you can never reach. And because of that, you feel all diminished. None of you are good enough. You can't meditate long enough. Your talks, you keep on telling the old jokes again. I've got a new joke for you today. This is a, <laughs> this is a Valentine's Day joke someone told me about this guy who went to the jewellers just before Valentine's Day to get an engagement ring. An engagement ring for the one he loved. So he went there and said, this is a nice ring, I want an engraving on it. He said, what, do you want her name on it? You know, to Julie or the one I love? No, no. He said, no, no, I think about it, no. I want you to write on, on the ring, to my one and only love. So why didn't you put her name on it? Well, you never know, it might not work out and I can reuse the ring afterwards. <laughs> my one and only love. <laughs> That's men's thinking for you, very practical. <laughs> But of course, my, my best Valentine's Day joke, I think I told this a little while ago, but it's, that's a really funny one, about the guy who asked his wife a couple of days before Valentine's Day, saying, darling, darling, it's Valentine's Day in a few days, what do you want? And she said, oh, no, no, I don't have to worry about Valentine's Day. But he'd been married long enough to not believe her. He said, oh, come on, I'm going to buy you a present, what do you want? Oh, thank you, darling. Because women always say they don't want, but they do want a present. <laughs> get it for them. <laughs> so, okay, what do you want? And she said, well, you know, you know, you're doing well these days, and I'm a girl, you know, just something with diamonds. <laughs> so his mother said, certainly, darling. And she, she was so excited when she opened up the package. On Valentine's Day, he'd brought her something with diamonds in it. A plaque, a pack of playing cards. <laughs> That's got diamonds in it. It's got 13 diamonds. <laughs> I think they were divorced next week. <laughs> but anyway, you see, so <laughs> you say bad jokes, but I don't demean myself because of that. You know, you tell so many people, so many talks, I've got to repeat myself again and again and again, but that's not the point. The point is, do you feel you're good enough? And it's because people have got it in and they're not good enough, that's one of the main reasons why they bully and abuse others. If you had an, a healthy self-esteem, basically you liked yourself, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to build yourself up by trying to diminish others with physical or verbal or other abuse of power in the office or the workplace or even in the school. So that's one of the reasons I've been talking here. Please praise your kids. Please praise yourself. Please open the door of your heart to yourself. Have a good 
esteem and accept yourself as you are. You are good enough, you are pretty enough, you're smart enough, you are good enough. I am good enough. Oh, what a great revelation that is, to understand that, to accept that, and to know that is true. So you don't have to prove yourself, which means you don't have to diminish others, which means a lot of abuse and bullying in the workplace and everywhere else disappear. And the other reason, obviously, why people bully is because they really think through coercion you can get things done. This is one of the other things, especially in Australia. What is Australia known for? It's sport, and those sporting heroes, they get there through incredible effort. Sometimes people say to me, oh, Ajahn Brahm, you really work hard. To be a meditator, it must be hard. Absolutely no. It's much more commitment and hard work and effort to being an elite sports star in today's world. Just have to watch their diet every... I can't watch my diet. They have to exercise. Well, maybe I should do a bit more exercise, but they have to get up really in the morning. They have to do so much, committed so much to being an elite sportsman, and they get there through willpower. Have you ever noticed, actually I read this, uh, this morning, I was told this morning by Rodney that there was a, a top South African Paralympic sports star who had just been accused of murdering his girlfriend. I mean, how many sports stars abuse other people? Why? Is there a connection there? Of course there is. And it is because they've got there through so much control, so much willpower, so much force, and they have succeeded to that point. And they think they can get whatever else they want in life through the same method. Through force, pushing, coercing. And it brought me to realize that, you know, bullying is also bullying your own body. Are you kind to your own body? Or do you give it abuse? Forcing it to do things it shouldn't do. Staying up late at night, doing the project, doing the work, when you should really be asleep. Not giving yourself enough rest. When you think about bullying as going to abuse of your own body, then you can understand where a lot of sicknesses come from, because there is a lot of personal abuse to your body. I'm not talking the people who have self-harm, who have scars on their wrist or on their arms. I'm talking about the other stuff you do to yourself, not being kind to yourself. Not giving yourself enough rest and relaxation, always pushing yourself, thinking that that way you can get where you want. These athletes, they really abuse their body. I don't mean by taking drugs, but pushing so much, a lot of them. And when you have that, that whole attitude, you will actually often, not always, there's some great sports stars, you know, natural talents who don't really have to push so much. And you can really respect them, but you can see there's a tendency there. You've got where you are through this force, through this control, and you go and force and control other people to get what you want. It's worked before you think it's going to work again. And you see that in the office, self-made millionaires, people who started their own business, they got so far. Sometimes they're incredible control freaks. Because that's where they've got... And I've told this to many monks, meditators. If you think you're going to get into powerful meditation through force, no way. You're just going to get big ego, very powerful, strong ego. If you've been controlling, all that does is feeds your sense of self and your sense of personal power. That sense of personal power, I can get what I want if I try hard enough. Where does that lead you? I can get my partner to do what I want. I can get my workers to do what I want as long as I push hard enough. That is abuse. That is bullying. And for those of you who have been around me long enough, the teachings here, never ever use that willpower, that force. Use wisdom power. Use compassion power. That works far, far better. So any boss who owns a company, or any manager who's trying to get things done, bullying, force, using power and the strength of your will, that never works as well as just inspiration, motivation, to get people to want to work for you, rather than to bully them into working for you. And so, if that could only be understood better, 
then all the force in the workplace, come on, work harder. No, you can't go home early tonight. You have to stay there. I've got a project which needs to be done. Now, if you know when people bully you like that, do you feel like working for them? Now, do you, are you motivated to actually to get the work done? You can stay there and just bloody buzz, as you would, swearing as you're trying to sort of focus on the work, and you're not really focusing on the toy, just thinking of you know, when you can leave and how you can get back at this terrible boss from hell. You just waste half of your brain getting angry. There's not much left to do the work. And imagine the opposite. And the opposite is like how we practice at a monastery. But there's work to be done. Any volunteers? And we really need this. You know, and I help you, you help me. If it's done out of kindness, out of friendship, out of mutual commitment to look after one another, it's easy to get volunteers. Just one example for those of you, I've, again, not, not, not that many examples, but every now and again you're really in trouble and you ask people to give you a hand and they do, they come up every time to give you a, a hand even though that they have to sacrifice seeing that time when we're just finishing off our meditation centre, Jhana Grove. Day before the floor was only half finished. The evening before the workers all went home. And the following day, we were going to have our opening ceremony at Jana Grove. Jeff Garrett was coming. Many of you were coming with the floor. And there was a whole retreat going to happen the next day. We had people coming from all over the world to have the first meditation retreat in Jana Grove Retreat Center opposite our monastery. And there was only half a floor there. So what happened? The monks. We asked the monks, monks, can you come and give a hand? So the monks were working till four o'clock in the morning that night, finishing off the floor. I could never order that. If I was a boss and bullied them, they would never ever have done that. But out of kindness and inspiration, it's an important thing to do. I really need your help. Would you mind? And of course, they all volunteer. I know that through experience of being a boss, an abbot, a manager. If you try and cajole people, coerce them, force them, they will never do it. Be kind to them, and they will. One last story. A person told me this, they were at a school fete. At this school fete, raising money for the school, for something or other, I don't know why the government can't pay the schools enough, but why well, you still need to raise funds yourself. So they had camel rides around the Oval. And it was a hot day, you know, like you know, these summer days we've just been having. And it was late and the guy with the camel was packing up. When a fellow arrived and said, look, can I have one ride of the camel around the park? He said, it's finished now. He said, oh, please, we pay double. I've always wanted to ride a camel. And so the owner of the camel said, OK, you know, it's double a bit extra money for the school, fine. And the guy said, OK, camel, get down. And the camel didn't move. No, I just paid a couple of dollars. Get down. And the camel didn't move. And so the owner came up to that camel and just started stroking it and talking to it. Camel, I forget what its name was. <laughs> What's a good name for a camel? Humpy, or I don't know. <laughs> okay, Humpty. That's a good way. <laughs> so, Humpty, you know, you've done such hard work all day. You know, I know you're tired. It's just really, really hot, and you're really exhausted. But this fellow, he's come from such a long way, and he really, really, really wants to ride you. Just one more person. I promise only one more person. And look, he's paying double. You're going to get twice as much for the school. So it's just a wonderful camel. Would you just mind getting down for this last camel? And the guy told me this. He said immediately that camel went straight down so he could get onto it and rode him around the park without any problem at all. You know, animals understand kindness. You hit the camel and the camel will just run away, will not cooperate at all. You be kind to it and it will do whatever you want. That is how you should manage people. Nice secretary, 
Look, I know you've been working very hard, and we know we don't pay you enough in this place, but that's all we've got. But you know, would you mind? Look, I know it's very difficult for you, but you know, we've got this big contract on over the weekend, Saturday morning, would you mind? We'll give you another day off another time. Please. <laughs> if you really do it with kindness, and you've always has been kind, and if that your boss asked you, and he'd always really been kind to you, or she, would you do that extra for them? You would. I would. So that's actually, you don't need to bully people. To coerce someone is not the way to go in life. And you've been coerced many times. Sometimes people have bullied you. Try to use fear to intimidate you, to make you do that extra work. It does not work. And it's just so unpleasant, physically, emotionally. So use good old compassion and kindness. You get far more things done. You can get what you want through kindness, much more than through force, through bullying. So that gives you a few ideas about where bullying comes from, how to deal with abuse and trying to sort of get an underlying way out of abuse. So see if we can lessen the hierarchies, lessen this, also this idea that you're not good enough. And when people realize that we're all good enough, then we don't need to try and prove it by bullying someone and proving we're superior. And if anything like that happens to you, see if you can find another way of dealing with it, not the usual way which they expect. And then those bullies will just not know really what to do and they leave you alone. And maybe you can teach that to others so we won't tolerate bullying. We can actually find another way of dealing with it and also find out the underlying reasons why bullying happens in the first place. Teach people to do different things in different ways and maybe the problem of bullying can be solved. And hopefully we can have a much better place for our kids to grow up in, places where we can work, better monasteries, better communicate, communities where bullying is a thing of the past. Thank you for listening. Very good. Now apparently today there's no questions from overseas, so all the questions are in-house. And just have a few questions before the monsters arrive. You've got some monsters coming this evening if you don't know, and there's due in about another 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So some questions about bullying. And if you don't ask a question, you'll be in big trouble, okay? I know who's not asking questions. <laughs> I'm not going to bully you. <laughs> yes. Okay, you're saying that uh, in some schools maybe hierarchies are not the problem at all? That uh, in some ranges those hierarchies... I've got to repeat this question for the uh, recording. That in some sort of uh, groups that kids feel like safe, they know where they are in those hierarchies and you're a teacher, you're in leader of bush rangers or whatever. I'm not quite sure because uh, in some sort of hierarchies like that, maybe you as a leader don't see the bullying which actually goes on when one person, because they're senior, because they're the captain and you're the junior, they try and exert that authority. So I'm a bit dubious. It'd be very interesting for someone to do some you know, decent research on the correlation between hierarchies and bullying and to see if there is something there. It makes a lot of sense to me that there is uh, something there, but the, the main thing you said at the beginning, where there is differences, and again, that means there can be bullying, the opportunity, because again, again, it's a hierarchy, it's you're different, which means you're inferior to me. You, know, you have a different color skin, you are inferior. Different religion, you are inferior. You know, maybe you're a different um, physical shape, you are inferior to me. And I think that underlying those differences, you know, will be that sense of superiority. Sometimes 
weren't so academic, yeah. Ah. Okay, the one who is a tall poppy gets cut down. And again, it's that's the other type of um, you know, the hierarchy, it's the other type of conceit. Now, I am better than you, or you're better than me, causes a sort of the, the sense of you no know, reverse bullying. We don't want anyone to be better than me, because that makes, makes me feel inferior. So, I think the, the core of that is that very insightful teaching that real conceit is thinking you're inferior to other people. A person who feels at ease with themselves doesn't need to bully. When you feel you are inferior, you're not good enough, then you'll pick on other people. Because it makes you feel better. And that's also with religions. Religions who feel inferior underneath will try and pick on other religions, say you're hopeless, you're wrong, you're going to go to hell. It's because they feel inferior. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, some more questions. Yes. Okay. Okay. You had an abusive situation in the past. And emotions come up regarding it. How do you make peace with that? I've been talking a lot about that in the last few months. And actually how you make peace with that is actually, it's a tough one to say, but you have to embrace it. Bring it in. Don't try and get rid of it. Which is maybe the opposite of what you expect. That, uh, it's been brief, because I think the monsters have arrived now. It's, uh, what you have to do is to open the door of your heart totally to everything which has ever happened to you in your past. That's who you are. Create don't shut it out. Don't demean it and don't think you're yeah, demeaned yeah, by that experience. Yeah, yeah. To say whatever has happened to me, whatever, beautiful, really painful, the door of my heart's open to everything. Come in. You have this incredible, powerful catharsis. The main thing which is bothering is actually not what actually happened, but the rejecting it. Not feeling at peace with it. Thinking it's a problem which I have to somehow get rid of it. Doing this opposite is so powerful, it's a tough thing to do. To bring that into your heart, but then you are whole. That's who you are. And you find you're much, once you embrace it, you transcend it, and you're better for it. It's tough, but try it. Nothing else works. Okay, so thank you for that. Now,